Hello, everyone. Welcome to the meeting of the uh, Fair Office Austria. I hope you can all hear me well. Okay, I see some nodding. Uh, my name is uh, Tomasz Miksa, and I'm going today to guide you through this uh, meeting. Uh, first of all, I would like to start with a few words on Fair Office Austria, who we are, what we do, and then present you the agenda of the meeting. Um, Fair Office Austria. Uh, is a place, is a contact point in Austria for anything regarding uh, fair principles. Fair principles are findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. And we provide both information for researchers uh, and also for infrastructure providers because achieving fairness is not a sole responsibility of the researchers. The researchers must have also the services uh, to use or they must have a place where they can ask for uh, for, for help. To, to learn more about the Fair Office Austria, please visit our website, fairoffice.at. Um, when it comes to the meeting today, uh, we are now in the part of the introduction. Uh, I'm going to uh, say a few words about the fair principles and sensitive data to give kind of an introduction here. And I will also ask you to answer three questions using Slido, so you may get your phone ready or a web browser ready. And then within the, the two hours, because the meeting today is planned between 10 and 12, within these two hours, we want to give you the, an information on, on how you can work, access and share sensitive data. And this will be covered in the first part by uh, Tanya Sharczewicz and, and Rudolf Meyer. Uh, they will give you some examples of the tools you can use for anonymization, for sensitive data generation, for working uh, with data in a privacy preserving way. Uh, then there will be a presentation by Gerald Sendera about the legal aspects of working with uh, sensitive data. And then, there will, then we will have two presentations uh, by the researchers from the Temuvin about the consent management and how you can actually describe consent in a machine readable way that the machines can quickly find out what can be done with data, what cannot be done with data, and about the, out, and about the auditability which is a process of how you can uh, basically prove that some things have happened with the data that somebody had access or not, and what are the means to, to achieve that. And uh, to conclude our meeting, Andreas Eckelhardt from SBA Research will give you an, a quick overview of a Wellford platform, uh, which is uh, um, a platform that was created within an FFG project that tries to couple all these things together. So provide the tools and environments for working with data and also providing means to manage consent and, and, and make the whole process auditable. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask them uh, in the chat. Uh, depending on how fast we go with the presentations, I will try to give a chance to ask one or two questions after each uh, presentation. So then just please unmute and, and, and ask your question or write the question in the, in the chat and we will ask, ask it to the uh, presenter. Uh, so that's it for the agenda for the housekeeping and uh, let's go to the Slido. So please go to slido.com and then put the number you can see in the slide, the 099. 807 or you can scan the QR code and the first question we have for you is about your background we would like to get to know uh, something about you uh, this question is left open on purpose we don't want to suggest you any, any default answers you can provide multiple answers so you can tell us uh, something about yourself and also this would be I guess interesting for other participants of the event and, and also to the speakers so that they can better uh, find out what what's the background of the audience. So what do we get here? Semantic web, researcher, informatic, agricultural sociology, research digital health, survey methodology, mm, data librarian, Biomedical engineering, privacy officer. I can see 12 answers. We have 38 people right now in the, in the meeting. So I will wait till at least we get 20. Okay. 
Okay, but I see that most of you, most of you are uh, researchers. Uh, we have some PhD students here. Um, we have people with life sciences background and people from museums. I can, I think I can reveal this. I have seen in the registration list, we have quite some people from the medical universities here. I don't see that in the, in the slider, but uh, <laughs> I can reveal that. Okay, we have 18 answers. Uh, we need two more so that I can change the slide. Nineteen twenty. Perfect. Okay, let's go next to the next slide, uh, which is about the fair principles. Because you know we've been talking about fair principles for quite some time, as the fair office has been running for two years, and the topic itself is not a new. And we would like to find out uh, how well you know the fair principles, because you might have attended many meetings, and the question is, you know them very well, or somehow, or you're just puzzled by them. Actually, it's quite good to see that uh, we don't have any newcomers because at this stage, I would assume everyone has heard about them. Uh, okay, 18 answers. Oh, never heard of, we have the first person, okay. Uh, 20, okay, but some of, most of you are somehow familiar with them and understand them quite well. Uh, we will just give a short overview of the fair principles here, uh, and I think we can continue the next question. Uh, so the second, so the first part of the title of the event is you know fair. The second part is sensitive data. So the question is, do you work with sensitive data, and if so, what kind of? And again, you have here a possibility to write anything you want. Uh, so please let us know something about. Uh, whether you work with and, and if, if you work, what kind it is. I see some medical data, health data, any, any more details on what this means, health data, patient data. Okay, interviews and questionnaire data, that's a nice example. Demographic data from surveys, micro data from statistical office. Preparation for research with MOD. What does MOD stand for? Can you write in the chat? Patient health record, questionnaire data, mm -hmm. data, farm level data. Mm -hmm. okay, and then MOD stands for Ministry of Defense UK. Uh -huh. Okay, we got our 20 answers. <laughs> we can continue. Um, okay, so uh, to conclude, uh, you are not the, you are not the person who hear for the first time about fair principles. You work with most of you work with sensitive data. So I see we have a group of people who is really in this topic. Um, so before we go to the presentations, just a uh, few things about the fairness for those who are for the first time. Uh, and I would like to start by clarifying uh, fair uppercase and fair lowercase, because you can come across both of these uh, uh, keywords when you search on the internet. In this meeting, we focus on the fair uppercase, meaning we focus on the fair principles, and we don't focus on, algorithm, on algorithmic fairness. The, the fair principles uppercase uh, deals with uh, applying the, making sure the data is properly managed, that it can be found, accessed, interpreted, and so on. And fair lowercase would deal with evading bias, you know, especially when you're designing an algorithm or a study. So this bias uh, topic is not the focus of our meeting today. Um, many of you might have been to several uh, meetings on fair principles. You might be familiar with these graphics. What I would like to say is that whenever you look for information about fair principles, check at the source, check the original publication, or check the website of the GoFair where the original principles are described. This is the, the best source of knowledge. Otherwise, you have to depend on many presentations where people actually are showing you their own interpretation of fair principles. And this leads to a big confusion in the in the community. And uh, here you can see this graphic. I think it's one of the one of the good ways to visualize them. 
And uh, each principle basically is decoupled and consists of sub principles. So in this example, you can see that findability requires data to use present identifiers, to have rich metadata, to be indexed in data repository, and so on. Please check carefully each of the principles whenever you uh, deal with, with fair principles. But today, our main focus of the event is actually on one of the sub principles, which is uh, in the accessibility and it's on the authentication when necessary. And this uh, sub principle says that fair data does not have to be open data. This is one of the common myths. So if your data is restricted, if you are providing uh, controlled means to access the data. If you're deciding to exclude it from public view for some reason, it still can be considered fair. As long as you provide clear access conditions, as long as it is clear what people should do to get access. So if there is some uh, board uh, which is deciding on the access, if somebody has to write you a request, or if it's just uh, you know, registering somewhere in the website, uh, this must be uh, described clearly. The key point is that fair principles are designed in such a way that all this information should be provided not only to humans in an easy way, but also to the machines. So when somebody is accessing in an automated way uh, to the resource, the machine should be able to find out what is the level of access to the data. And for example, if the data is restricted, the user should then get a notification because the machine has identified, oh, I need to, for example, go and talk to someone to get the, uh, the access. Uh, you shouldn't use the sensitivity of data as an excuse for not making the data fair, because uh, the fact that you're working with some kind of special data has, access, has impact on who can access the data as I have presented in the previous slide, but there are other things to consider like findability, interoperability, and reusability. And you can still, for example, uh, focus on the interoperability. You can still use well-defined vocabularies, taxonomies, data models, ontologies to structure your data in an easy to understand way to make it interoperable. You can still consider creating good documentation and collecting rich provenance to make sure that people can trust the data because they understand how it was collected, from whom, and how to actually uh, reuse it. And the same is about uh, findability. You can still use present identifiers, uh, create rich metadata, and so on. So the key message here is sensitive data is a special case, but we can still make, uh, make it fair, and we can still apply individual principles on it. And the focus of, 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 of today and, and the lineup of, of speakers that we have uh, uh, today, um, they will focus on how you can, uh, what you can do with the data when you access it. So what are the tools and techniques you can use to prepare the data for others to access it? And what are the other non-technical -tech things to consider? Uh, so that's the plan for today. Uh, are there any questions about the meeting before we switch to the next speaker? I don't see any questions, so I would like to invite uh, Tanya Szarczewicz and, and Rudolf Meyer to uh, tell us now about working and accessing and sharing sensitive, sensitive uh, data. The floor is yours. Okay. Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, Tomek, thanks for the introduction. Let me just. You're muted. My... I'm muted. Uh, we're here, Rudy. I, so, I heard you, Rodolf. <laughs> Sorry. I, I hear it also. Okay, so then, then I assume that it works on my side and just how much has no, I, I have muted. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Good. At least at least the microphone test. Also, good morning from me. <laughs> okay. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. The usual question that you still have to ask. So, um, hello again from, from my side and, and Tanya. So, we are both researchers at SPA Research and we work there in the machine learning and data management group. And in our research, we deal a lot with privacy preserving aspects of, of machine learning. And today we would like to talk a bit about a few techniques that you can use to actually make sensitive data uh, still shareable and accessible. This is just a 
let's say a partial view because there are many many techniques and we don't have time and and to to discuss all of them but hopefully this can give you an idea so what we will talk about first we briefly define what we actually understand with with sensitive data and, and privacy issues of that and then we talk a bit about anonymization techniques there will also be a, a demo about that and then we talk to you about synthetic data generation and in the end we have a brief introduction on what trusted research environments are and there will also be a, a demo for that so i think we take around 45 minutes for the whole block uh, let's see if we if you manage to keep the time. So basically privacy preserving uh, data analysis becomes an issue because we have large amounts of data uh, that we want to deal with. And very often this data contains some kind of information ab about individuals, about persons, and therefore analysis, distribution, sharing, and so on, often conflicts kind of with regulations that you might have. And let's not even talk about uh, ethical requirements, but just there's also a lot of legal uh, regulatory requirements that you might need to fulfill. When we talk about data privacy, we basically mean that we would like to, or the challenge there in, in data in protecting the data privacy is to use the data for, I don't know, doing machine learning or other kind of data analysis while we still protect the individual's privacy. So we don't really release information about specific uh, people. And privacy is basically the ability of an individual or maybe a group of people to basically hide information or not really reveal information about themselves. We're mostly concerned with microdata. So this is data at the level of an individual. If data is already aggregated, then uh, there's normally no real or direct uh, privacy implications here. And if you talk about threats to privacy, especially if you release data, if you release uh, machine learning models and stuff like this, this might be slightly different. But if you release data, then we would in many cases distinguish between these three types of uh, disclosure or privacy threats that can happen. So identity disclosure, attribute disclosure, or membership disclosure. And I briefly want to uh, describe each of them. Basically, identity disclosure, or sometimes also called the re-identification, means that in a database, I can actually figure out which individual belongs to a certain data entry. So if I have, for example, this small data set, I don't really have an identifier in the data set, so I don't know a person's name. I just have some other attributes. If I'm able to do an identity disclosure, I can say, for example, I don't know, second record here, this would be Thomas. That would be a form of identity disclosure. That's, of course, a very uh, powerful or very damaging disclosure. Attribute disclosure, I could do even if I'm not able to specifically link uh, a name or an identifier to a certain row in a data set. But basically, this discloses some sensitive attributes which you would normally not like to have revealed, for example, the salary of a person. So for example, if I know uh, a similar data set from before, I have a birth date, I know the sex of a person and the education, and I don't know information about the salary. But if I'm able to actually infer uh, the salary for these records, then this would be a kind of attribute disclosure because I'm revealing information about an attribute that I didn't know before. And the third type of disclosure that you normally distinguish is the so-called membership disclosure. This is likely the, the weakest form of disclosure because it kind of reveals the least information, but it's still uh, highly relevant. Basically, what I'm able to infer here is simply if a person was a member of a certain data set or not. And this doesn't really disclose any information from the data set itself, but it allows me maybe to infer some meta information. For example, if I know that this is a data set describing uh, people with a certain infectious disease, and I know that a certain person was in that data set, I can infer that this person also maybe has suffered uh, from the disease or similar uh, application settings you can think of. And identity disclosure, where I'm able actually to ad directly identify and pinpoint to a certain person in the data set, obviously automatically leads to attribute a membership disclosure because I would know all the attributes sent from this person and I also know that that person was part of the data set or not. So this is the most powerful uh, kind of uh, disclosure that can happen. Now, if you want to do actually uh, still some data analysis on this data, but without actually being able to reveal information about who are the people inside and, and, and maybe not revealing attributes and, and membership, then principle two main approaches that you can do. 
The first one is uh, mostly referred to as privacy preserving data publishing. And that basically means I'm doing a de-identification of the information, making sure that the data that I'm publishing does not really contain this uh, information that I can use to re-identify or to do other inference. And we'll talk today briefly about uh, these approaches, anonymity, a bit about differential privacy and also synthetic data generation as one of the most uh, recent approaches here. And another approach that you could do is a privacy preserving computation, which basically means that you make sure that the computed result doesn't allow any inference on the data. So basically allowing access to the full data, but the only thing that the analyst gets back is actually the, the, the result. And we talk about some safe haven approaches here. I want to first also clarify a few other terms that maybe are uh, considered as privacy preserving techniques and maybe uh, mentioned in some contexts. Uh, one thing would be encryption. And basically encryption means that you transform your data into some scrambled, unreadable uh, encrypted cipher text, which basically means that nobody that does not have the, the correct key uh, cannot decrypt and therefore cannot read the data. And basic encryption, uh, you could see as some kind of means to enable data security, but not necessarily privacy because encryption protects against unauthorized access. So I'm not able to, if I don't, I'm not authorized to access it, I'm not able uh, to read the data and, and do anything with it. And encryption is something you should basically always use. Uh, you should use it to protect your data while it's on the storage. So if this is your personal uh, uh, machines, if this is your server infrastructure on site, or if this is on, in the cloud, um, this you should basically always uh, encrypt the data whenever it is kind of resting. And you should also use it during data transfer if you exchange it with someone, um, basically to achieve, achieve data security. But it doesn't really protect against cases where someone actually has a legitimate access to the data and would then try to infer something about the information. So if you give access to researcher to train the machine learning model on, they normally have access to the data. Um, so they're authorized to access the data, but they still should not learn uh, information about the individuals. And this is basically what we are, what we are concerned with. And another uh, term that is sometimes used and, and mentioned as, as one technique to achieve uh, kind of privacy preservation is pseudonymization, uh, which is basically means that we disguising uh, the identity. So we have some kind of fictitious names uh, for individuals, for persons. This is something that people have used uh, throughout history and authors and artists a lot. And it's also something that you can use with data to basically replace the direct, uh, the identifier with some kind of pseudonym. Could be a one-way pseudonymization that you cannot reverse or could be reversible. Um, Gerald, uh, my colleague will talk later about what pseudonymization basically means for the GDPR point of view. But basically uh, what has been shown is that pseudonymization doesn't really prevent re-identification. Just because I replace the identifier of someone, it makes it of course harder to do certain uh, inference, but I can still re-identify uh, people to quite large extents if I have other information available. There have been notable cases like with the Netflix price uh, where people were able to re-identify uh, a lot of people. So this is a part of a solution potentially and pseudonymization is most of the times done anyway to uh, not have the direct identifiers, but it's still also not enough. So when we talk about uh, anonymization, actually it's good to also distinguish what kind of uh, attributes and what kind of data do we have in, in our data sets. So we might have on the one hand direct identifiers, so social security numbers, driving license, phone numbers, stuff like this. And this is normally uh, taken care of with pseudonymization. So you replace this with some pseudonyms and then you don't directly have the same uh, social security number. You cannot really identify someone. But then we also have other types of attributes that are of interest. So we have the so-called quasi identifiers. So this is basically some kind of personal, many times demographic information uh, that itself doesn't identify a person. So if I know a birth date of someone, this doesn't uniquely identify a person. But if I know some of these attributes together, so maybe I know the birth, birth date, the sex, the zip code, um, then many people become actually uniquely identifiable. On the previous slide, there was actually a pie chart saying, I think it was 83% of the people in the US, for example, with these three attributes become uniquely identifiable. And then we have sensitive attributes, and this is basically the kind of attributes that we want to protect. So this is maybe your, your health diagnosis, your, your salary or things like this. 
We might also have insensitive attributes. Good news is we don't really need to care about them. If they're not sensitive and they're not quasi-identifiers, then they're, they're the easiest to deal with. And the first technique that um, people use quite frequently to basically ensure that you cannot do, for example, re-identification is the so-called k-anonymity. And in k-anonymity, I ensure that we have at least k records that have the same quasi-identifiers. So you see here in the bottom, a small data set, just eight samples. And we see people uh, where we say that we have quasi-identifier, the age, that's so not exactly the birthday, just the age and the zip code. And then we have one sensitive attribute, the, the medical diagnosis. And basically you would see that uh, most of these elements here would be uniquely identifiable if you know the age and the zip code of someone. So you could exactly pinpoint and say, uh, if I know someone is 22 years old and has a zip code of 28, it's the fifth record. So what you do in, in K-anonymity, on the one hand, you do generalization of values. So for example, you change the exact age to range of values. So now I say the age is not 22 anymore, but it's something between 20 and 30, and the zip code is something between 10 and 30. And you see now that I have a couple of groups where I cannot distinguish people. So the first two, and then the second three, and then the last three. These are all these uh, blocks or groups together that cannot be distinguished. Generalization is one approach. Sometimes suppression uh, is, is needed, or the better approach, if you look at this uh, slightly smaller data set, you see the first two records and the last two records, they are already quite similar to each other. So the similar age, they live in a similar neighborhood, um, but the, the third record here completely stands out, a much older person living in a totally different neighborhood. So maybe in such cases, generalizing would mean removing too much information, so I actually going to maybe suppress this information. So this is a record that we maybe completely remove or at least partially uh, remove information from. That's sometimes a so-called cheaper approach because you would lose less information. And the third approach that is sometimes used to, to make people indistinguishable is so-called microaggregation. This works very well if you have data that has numeric attributes. So for example, the height in centimeters and the weight in kilograms. And then this is my, my sensitive attribute. And instead of generalizing this to a value range, I basically just take the averages within each group. So within the first group, I have an average. And with the other uh, group, I have another average. This has sometimes advantages of making the data more directly usable for computation further on. So this uh, kind of groups of elements that share the same values, they're sometimes called the Q blocks or the equivalence classes. And Basically, your goal is to transform your original data set so that you have these Q blocks of a size of at least K. That's where also the K in K anonymity stems from. What the K is, uh, if this is two or five, this is a decision you have to basically take. But basically, you would like to achieve uh, a data set that has these kind of properties. And normally, it's quite, diff uh, quite easy to say that if a certain data set uh, with a certain number of uh, quasi identifiers of certain attributes identified as quasi identifiers, does this satisfy uh, a so-called k-anonymity? So does it satisfy free anonymity or five anonymity? So this is easy to, uh, to figure out. What's not so easy to do is to actually find uh, solutions for that because the solutions are not unique. There could be many ways to achieve the same level of k by either generalizing the first attribute or the fifth attribute and so on. Um, and this is basically a, a large uh, search space and that therefore you have many heuristic solutions that find an approximately optimal uh, solution and there are many different algorithms. So if you talk about canonymity, there's not one canonymity algorithm, but there are at least like 10 different uh, algorithms that try to find uh, an optimal solution. And now with this, uh, let's go directly uh, to a small demo. Uh, Tanya has prepared a demo for the ARCS anonymization toolkit, which is a very nice um, toolkit because it has actually also a graphical user interface and it's very nice to to use. I have also here on this link, there's that's a nice GitHub report that has an overview of other tools uh, that you can use, but uh, we go with Fox. So Tanya, do you take over screen sharing, I guess? Uh, yes. Okay, so yeah, as Rudolf said, uh, ARCS is uh, one of the very comprehensive tools with a nice graphical user interface for uh, K anonymity. Uh, so I will now show you a little bit how to how it looks like and, and what can 
uh, one do in, in ARCs. Uh, so here I already um, included some data. You can see that this is, uh, these are demographical attributes. So we have sex, age, race, uh, marital status of a person and so on. So the first step uh, in, uh, in uh, starting with K-anonymity would be to actually identify what kind of identifiers or what kind of attributes uh, would be um, the, these that we have in the data set. So if you remember what uh, Rudy said up until now, uh, quasi identifiers would be those that can in combination um, identify a person, not uh, by themselves. So we can, we can actually for every single attribute here, we can uh, identify the type uh, of the attribute. So here we choose quasi identifying for all of these attributes. And then we can see that for all these quasi identifiers, we have a certain hierarchy uh, for generalization of that attribute. So in case of something simple such as uh, sex, we would only have one generalization level that would lead to uh, to completely generalizing the, the attribute. But then for age, for example, we can have something more granular such as, uh, such as this. So we would narrow down or um, narrow down the uh, ranges of uh, age, age groups. Um, okay, and then we can, uh, in this area, we can actually uh, choose what we want to do with data. So we can say, okay, we want uh, five, un uh, apply five anonymity, so uh, K anonymity with uh, five. Uh, also here, we can define suppression limit for the generalization. So what this means is that, uh, as, as Rudolf also mentioned before, uh, we can have some kind of outliers in the data, which would maybe lead to overgeneralizing the data set in a, in a K anonymous um, version. So we want to say, okay, maybe it's uh, acceptable to suppress some of the records if our uh, generalized data will then be maybe, uh, will have more information in it. And okay, then we can apply uh, K anonymity. I don't know if you see pop up. The window as well, uh, but it takes a few moments. The algorithm that runs behind ARCs is called Flash, and uh, it's uh, it's it's very fast. Um, okay, and then we get our results. So what we see here is are all possible generalizations that uh, uh, that basically can be applied on the data set, and then that. Uh, result in five anonymity. So also what we, um, uh, how do we choose the best one? We always need to choose some kind of uh, utility metric that, uh, that will be used in this, hier uh, in this uh, search uh, to actually identify the best one. So, okay, we, we see that uh, ARGS decided for the best one. We can see which generalization it is. So it says, uh, zero, it means that our sex attribute got, um, so didn't get uh, generalized. Then we have um, two, which means that age attribute got generalized to, uh, to level two in its hierarchy and so on. And then we can see how this data looks like finally. So on the left side, this is the original data that we had and on the right side, uh, the K anonymous data. And we can see really nicely here the equivalence uh, bl blocks or equivalence classes of the uh, data where all of the uh, participants have the same exact same um, information. And uh, some of them are bigger than five because uh, that would be the only possible way to, to, group, uh, to, to group the records. But you can see that there are some that are smaller, some that are bigger. Okay. Uh, good, then uh, ARCS also provides us some kind of summary statistics for the anonymous data set. Uh, so we can, for example, maybe see distribution of, um, of the resulting uh, attributes, uh, contingency table, uh, then class sizes, as I said, uh, so these are the classes, the equivalence classes where everybody has the same information. 
so we see minimal class size is five, which is uh, good because this is five, uh, five anonymization. And then uh, some are way bigger, so with 175. Then we can also see um, maybe some classification performance. So what, um, how, how this data, how the anonymous data actually um, affects the utility of, uh, of some tasks, classification tasks that we would want to perform. So maybe here I would need to choose um, something. Okay, so the target variable for some machine learning, um, lear, uh, machine learning uh, task. And we can then compare how the original data set performs and how K anonymous data set uh, would perform. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so this is uh, in short, maybe a little introduction of ARCs. Uh, there is many more uh, options here that uh, maybe I would skip, but the, uh, just for you to get the, the feeling of, um, of the tool. And I would uh, get back to Rudolf now. Okay, uh, so as mentioned on this uh, other link, you find many other tools that are similar to ARCs, maybe not uh, having exactly the same functionality, but um, quite a lot of uh, tools to choose from. As, as Tanya mentioned, basically, uh, it's always important to check if you do anonymization, you lose some kind of information because you're generalizing or maybe suppressing. So you normally uh, have less information available. Normally the larger uh, your K size gets, so the less distinguishable the, the individuals get, the more information you lose. And Tanya showed you one example for a certain K value, how to measure this on the machine learning task. And in general, you would see a trend like this. So the larger your K gets, uh, the more privacy you basically have the less utility you have in your data. Uh, how you measure this, whether it's with a machine learning task or you look at uh, statistical changes in the data. So I don't know how mean values change and stuff like this, this is uh, uh, up to you. And basically up to the task that you want to do with the data, but normally you can expect some utility loss. We also have to point out that K-anonymity is by itself not enough because K-anonymity maybe prevents you to re-identify a certain person. But if you look here at this example on the top right, uh, maybe it doesn't really matter if I know if the person is the second, uh, the first, the second, or the third entry. If the sensitive attribute is the heart disease, I would figure out that this person has a heart disease regardless of knowing whether it's the first, second, and third. And this is basically only what K-anonymity prevents you from directly identifying. There's then extensions like L-diversity and T-closeness and I don't know, like at least 10 to 20 other techniques that people have proposed uh, to prevent certain uh, kind of inference that can be done if you have a sufficient amount of back background knowledge. There are a few other limitations, of course, with K-anonymity. Um, so it's very difficult to assess, for example, what uh, attributes are quasi-identifiers because this is maybe clear at the moment, uh, but in the future this might change maybe because maybe more data gets available for, for an attacker and then other attributes become a, a quasi-identifier. So it's not difficult, it's not easy to say uh, what is available in the future that would uh, maybe potentially break your anonymization. But still, uh, canonymity is, a, is an approach that's used quite frequently when you want to directly publish the data set. Um, a slightly uh, related approach, uh, but on a different principle. And here we go only very briefly into this topic because it's uh, a lot of mathematical background is so-called differential privacy. And here the goal is basically not to prevent uh, re-identification in the data set or something like this, but uh, the ultimate goal is to say that if a person is part of a data set, the risk to the privacy for this person should not change. Um, that would basically mean, or at least should not substantially change. So basically, if a certain person is or is not in a database, the privacy risk for this person should not change much. This basically means if we have some original data set and then we apply some kind of processing on it, uh, and then we have an output, from this output, you should not be able to figure out if uh, no, the fifth person was in there or this person was in there. What this process is, uh, this could be simple processes like simple statistical analysis, like counting, uh, for example, how many people would have red hair or what's the average age. So relatively simple statistical moments to compute, or it could also be more complex uh, processes like actually training a machine learning model uh, that would maybe predict 
which of these people uh, likes a dog or whatever. So all of these, uh, the output, the resulting output of the process should not endanger a certain person's uh, privacy. So if you have this setting, a data set with or without a certain person, the output of the process that you run, so the statistical analysis, the mean, uh, so the, for example, the, the mean age should not uh, differ much, but it should be basically uh, the same. And you normally apply this, or you normally achieve this by adding some noise to the output. So you don't really actually return the exact mean value, but you return the exact mean value plus some noise, where the noise is basically uh, justified by what type of analysis you do, how sensitive the analysis is, and then you distort this to a certain extent. And then basically, if I get two results from two different databases, I cannot say, was this one person inside or not? So the privacy of this person is not infringed. Uh, this is a relatively simple approach for uh, simple statistical operations, uh, like computing a mean value or something like this. It gets a bit more complicated if your process is actually learning a machine learning model, but there's also solutions uh, for this. One uh, disadvantage of this approach maybe is that the control over where this process is run and executed needs to basically, most of the times, at least stay with the data owner because you need to apply the perturbation, this noise adding to the output result. So it's not that I can easily give you the data set you compute uh, the mean value, and then I trust that you add some uh, statistics, some some noise on it. Uh, basically, this needs to run at at the site where the, the data is residing. So this is a big uh, practical difference also to to k anonymity. So you add noise, and then the output should be the same. Good. Uh, very brief intro. Uh, if you want to read more about differential privacy, there's a lot of materials. We will also provide some, and also this. Where this image is from, this is a very nice source, uh, very easily written to, to read about. The, the third data publishing method that we want to briefly mention is synthetic data. This is something that has gained a lot of attention recently. And the idea is here that basically I don't really publish real data that I have de-identified and somewhat treated because that will still always bear certain risks. So even if you do anonymity, there's potentially some risks and also different privacy is maybe not always easy in practice. And very often we actually don't really care if the data uh, is real samples that have been de-identified because maybe what we want to do in many settings is to identify the global uh, statistics and the global trends in the data. So in synthetic data, the idea is that I publish some data that resembles uh, the real data. So it preserves the global characteristics, for example, correlation between attributes uh, and other statistical properties but it doesn't really contain real individuals. And basically I have normally some real measurements from which then I just in some way generate new data. This is uh, different from maybe using test data in, in software development or so, where you maybe try to generate edge cases to test the behavior of your functionality. Here, we really try to generate data that resembles the original data. And the approach is normally that we have some data as an input, we learn some kind of representation from that data, some kind of model, and then we use that model to generate new data. And the new data will have the same uh, structure, the same properties, um, but it will not contain exactly the individuals that you had initially, but hopefully the global statistics uh, stay the same. So for maybe initially this as an input data set, I learn some model, and then I generate another data set where you see that there's no one-to-one -one resemblance between any of the input samples to the output samples but the, the overall properties, like the, the, the age ranges and, and how much money they have, that still uh, resembles. There's also some tools that in addition then provide maybe some other uh, protection. So maybe they add in addition differential privacy to the output, uh, but that, that's optional. There's many different tools and they mostly uh, differ in what kind of model they're learning to represent the data. So very simple approaches would just maybe learn independently for each attribute, the, the probability uh, density function, and then use that. There are some that would maybe look at correlations between the variables, so they learn a, 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 a pairwise correlations or more complex correlations. There are some that, for example, learn so-called Bayesian networks to learn the dependencies and probabilities between variables. And there's also some deep learning approaches that use, for example, generative adversarial networks, where you have uh, one network generating images, then other one, distinguishing whether these images, for example, are correct or not, or real or not, 
and then they learn in sync to to get a, a new data and this doesn't only work for images but for any kind of data so there are many different approaches uh, the simpler the approach is the easier it is normally to use uh, but normally they are less uh, accurate in representing if you want to evaluate how how well uh, a data set resembles the original data set a synthetic data set we can for example then look at single uh, variable distributions so the green would be the original data and then you have two different synthesizers and you see for example that the orange one the data synthesizer package is quite close in resembling uh, the, the original distribution another synthesizer approach is synthetic data world is maybe not as good uh, at least in this in this data set you can also check how well uh, pairwise correlations are uh, I preserved, sorry, there was some one image missing. So this is the pairwise uh, correlation that you had initially maybe, and then you check how well is this preserved with uh, a certain uh, anonymization tool. And if, that's the, uh, if that stays more or less the same, then you could say your data is quite much resembling. And of course you could have, again, evaluate this with I don't know, learning a machine learning model. You would have here the currency of the original model, uh, say getting you 82 points free, let's say, a currency or any other measure. And then you would see some synthesizers get really, really close to that. So uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.6 as a difference. Some other ones uh, maybe don't manage to recreate the data as good so that the machine learning model that you learned on top of it can preserve uh, the original utility. So some settings, really, you get extremely close to the performance of the original data set. Sometimes you might even get better performance than the original data, uh, but it's rather the, the exception, but you can get very close. You might also wonder, are there still some privacy risks uh, left in, in synthetic data? And this is maybe something that is not yet fully answered, uh, at least not answered as well as maybe for other techniques like differential privacy and so on. But if you look at the different uh, privacy risks that can happen, Normally, you would say that you can't really uh, do identity disclosure because there's no one-to-one -one correspondence from an original to a synthetic data sample. What could happen, of course, is that you could by chance recreate an exact sample that existed also in the original data set, but the chances for this are normally extremely small, uh, depending on, on what your attribute and value ranges. This might be um, one to hundreds of thousands or, or even one to millions or something like that. So this could be very small. There's also not really any attacks that uh, are able to say if there's membership disclosure and attribute disclosure from a synthetic data set might be normally still possible, but it's normally less uh, successful than if you would have this uh, with real data. So this is also normally uh, in general good news, but there's still a lot of uh, work to maybe assess this uh, properly. But there's already a lot of tools available <clears throat> and many of these, <clears throat> sorry, many of these tools actually are really nice in the user interface. Uh, so I've mentioned the synthetic data walls, and I've also mentioned data synthesizer, which are both in, in Python. They've actually quite nice extensive documentation and they're a really nice uh, how-to. Uh, Synthpop is another tool that's actually quite well maintained as well. It's written in R, if that's your favorite language. And there's also commercial tools arising. So there's actually, for, for example, also a startup company in Vienna, mostly AI, that provides a commercial uh, tool, which has obviously more focus on um, usability. Yeah, then with this, I would uh, then hand over again to Tanya. I guess you share from your screen. Yes, I will share from my screen. I think it's easier. OK, uh, everything OK, you see it. <laughs> uh, so I, I will continue now um, with uh, trusted research environments, or TREs for short that are also sometimes called uh, safe havens. So these, these are a general term that uh, encompass, encompass types of approaches that use some kind of uh, secure computation environment to preserve privacy of individuals in the sensitive data sets. Um, so what this means is that we don't modify the data as we do through anonymization approach, for example, or we don't generate new set as, as in case with synthetic data, but we rather compute directly on the original data, but in a way that, um, that would uh, restrict the leakage of uh, sensitive information. So this is the difference uh, from the techniques that we have talked uh, until now. Uh, also, what is different uh, is that we don't uh, have a setting where we would release the data or publish the data, but rather with these methods, we 
uh, kind of allow in, uh, operations on the data without seeing or accessing it on the individual level. Uh, maybe a simple way to imagine this is, um, uh, so you in this small data set, uh, you cannot see what age a certain person is, in case David, uh, which would be a sensitive information, uh, but you would uh, rather query an average age of all male participants. So some kind of summary, um, summary operation, which is supposed not to be a sensitive information, right? It's just an average. So instead of getting an attribute value of particular data entry, uh, we obtain some kind of summary statistics about the data to, to avoid um, getting a singling out one, one uh, person or one entry from the data set. <clears throat> so why can even a simple uh, example of summary operation like this be actually problematic? Uh, well, with some smart querying or with, with some um, background knowledge, maybe also, uh, one could still reveal a particular attribute value of an individual if we can query as much as we want. So for example, with this uh, additional query with uh, sex and the zip code, so we would still get um, David's exact age. Um, also, um, sometimes data can simply be, uh, it simply can properties that are unlucky, let's say for individuals in the data set, so that even with a simple query, we can, we could still infer information about the individual. And to solve this, uh, the trusted research environments generally allow the access to the data analysis to the users, but keep data in some kind of secure storage that cannot be uh, accessed directly. So there are several uh, building blocks to the TREs that are usually combined to, uh, to prevent, the, prevent the misuse of data. So first of all, the users of the data um, the users of the data or the data analysts are, are required to have some kind of authorization uh, to access the environments. So what the access means is that the users get assigned to so-called uh, workstation or sometimes a project, which is basically an isolated virtual environment through which the computations can be done only by the assigned users for that workstation, for that project. And then connections to the workstations are secured via VPN or some kind of two-factor authentication or both. Um, so through these workstations, uh, what users can do is usually limited. Uh, so as I mentioned before, what one can do some aggregate statistics, for example, uh, but not more specific queries. Or sometimes this is solved uh, such that computations are possible only on subsets of data or on anonymized data and so on. Um, also, what can happen is that uh, the time limit can be, uh, can be put uh, on access to the data. Uh, and uh, we can, so the data can be actually uh, secured, um, securely stored centrally, but some uh, trusted research environments uh, actually enable computation on data that is federated on multiple cooperating parties that by themselves uh, don't want to, so by themselves want to share the data, but don't want to com uh, combine their data with the other parties. Um, okay, we, saw, we have some examples of the uh, trusted research environments. For example, OSDIP is a data visiting platform developed by researchers from Technical University of Vienna. Then a few others we have that are uh, based in UK, for example, uh, Hertz, Safe Havens, Sale Data Bank, uh, research environment for, um, for Genomics England data set, and finally DataShield that we will talk uh, in more detail uh, about. So Data Shield is one example of trusted research environment for non-disclosive data analysis. Uh, the idea of Data Shield is uh, that data providers hold their data in their respective data stores. So the data is distributed uh, and the analyst is enabled to perform their analysis on this data, uh, which is then combined for the analysis from these several parties. Um, each party is one data shield server with their own data store. And technology used for the data stores is called Opal. So you can see in this architecture, 
Uh, so Opal provides uh, storage of the data, and then DataShield allows the analysis commands to go from DataShield client uh, through the firewall to these DataShield servers and return requested summary statistics back to the client or to the analyst. And you can see also in this architecture that we have our server on the server side and there is our studio on the client side. And this is because DataShield is in fact uh, a modified R uh, modified R statistical environment. So data shield packages are R functionalities modified to, um, uh, to disable operations on data that might be disclosed. So those uh, who are maybe familiar with R will notice R-like functions in this uh, set of uh, subset of data shield functionalities. Uh, here they are under data shield package with, with where this DS in front of the function name stands for. Uh, so for example, there is a set of uh, aggregate summary statistics that are re-implemented in DataShield in a non-disclosive way, uh, such as mean variance, uh, mean by class, so on. Then we have uh, some data preparation functions, um, such as uh, cha uh, changing the types of, uh, of uh, data and so on. Then we have modeling functions, uh, for example, generalized linear model and some related functionalities to this. Uh, also plotting is possible in a non-disclosive way. So we have histograms, box plots, scatter plot, and so on. Um, so as you can see, this means that um, each functionality has to be re-implemented in DataShield and available through, through the package. Um, so DataShield is open source. So in last years, actually the set of different functionalities has, um, has quite expanded thanks to the community. Um, so, so yeah, this is just a subset basically. And okay, when I say non-disclosive versions of function, what does it mean? Well, this is actually specific for each function. For example, some summary statistics uh, such as mean or variance uh, will not be allowed if number of instances on which they are computed is not above a certain threshold. So if there's not enough data to compute on, they will simply be denied. Uh, then for plotting functions, uh, sometimes we have that outliers will not be plotted and, uh, and, and yeah, similar, similar things. And now maybe it's a good time to, so, to, uh, uh, so that I switch to demo of the data shield. Um, so, okay, I will, <clears throat> so I will, I will, uh, I will show you um, how data is stored in Opal and then uh, some functionalities that we can actually perform on this data in DataShield and how it looks like. So just that there is a general feeling. Um, okay, so I hope you see my uh, how the screen changed. <laughs> um, so we have um, Opal, which is basically a, can somebody some just confirm that uh, it's, uh, it's okay. Good. Um, uh, so Opal is uh, basically data storage, okay? So it, uh, um, I already prepared some uh, uh, data here. So this is inside of a project, inside of the workstation that, uh, that we are dealing with. Uh, so we have uh, two tables here, patient and observation, something very simple. So some medical related data. Oh, no. Sorry for this. Uh, okay, so patient table. Uh, so we have some um, attributes such as gender, age, country, and ID of the patient. And then in relation to that, we have observations for these patients. So some kind of biomarker, which could be, for example, pulse respiratory quotient. So some kind of medical data. Okay, uh, this is our data. And how do we access it? Well, we, uh, we do it through through data shield. So we have our R Studio environment where we perform um, the, the operations. So where we code, uh, co code uh, what we want to do. Uh, here, first of all, we need to, of course, include uh, libraries of data shield into, uh, into our environment. So we have a DS based client, which is for, uh, for functions. So for summary statistics, and then DS Opal is for the connections uh, to the uh, to the Opal to the data store, and then we uh, do this connection through um, to, through these functions. So we have our server uh, URL. 
So we are specified to what we can actually access uh, within the Opal, to, to only to our project. Uh, we, we see that authentication is also done through the Opal uh, function. So we have uh, some kind of user and, uh, username and password. And then we assign tables to, to our work environment. So we have here observation table, and then we can also add the other table, which was, uh, which was patient. Uh, okay, good. So what you can, uh, yeah. Good. So then uh, I will uh, show you now, uh, we will ultimately build a linear model on this uh, patient and observation data that I showed you. And to get there, I will also go through some other smaller functionalities to, uh, so you see what is possible and how does it look like. So for example, first thing could be uh, that uh, what we can do is, for example, assigning a new name to some data column. Uh, so here we say uh, assigning a new name to the uh, ID ID attribute to to a patient um, to the patient table. So what you can see here, and you will see in every function, is a new object, uh, and this is very important. Uh, this is how the new objects are assigned in data shield. So everything is server side. We never have explicitly new objects that we can access through uh, normal R functionality of any, or any other function. So this is, uh, I cannot say, for example, now print this uh, patient ID or, or similar things. Um, yeah, so everything is stored server side and then only through uh, data shield functionality, we can, um, uh, we can access these objects. Good, then I can, uh, for example, subset a data table. So we say here uh, from the observation table, take a subset of uh, its attributes. And again, everything is uh, stored in objects on server side. So then I can merge data tables with which we will need for our linear model at the end. So um, I can merge the observation table and uh, patient table based on the I, patient ID, right? And okay, I, I will skip forward a few a few steps, but uh, then we can also show how we can change the data types. So another functionality, the data shield. And again, those who are familiar with R can really maybe notice that these functions are really R functions just under data shield package. Okay. And now finally, we get to some summary statistics. So I can, for example, plot a histogram for one attribute uh, in, uh, from my data. So here we have the output uh, of, of this histogram. Uh, then we can, for example, say, uh, give us a summary function for, for another attributes and other attribute. And uh, wait. so here in the bottom in the console, you see that I hope you see that we have printed out the, for example, quantiles uh, and mean of, of this uh, attribute that we want to, that we are interested in. And then finally, we can build our regression model. So we do it through GLM function. Again, this is our, our function just under uh, data shield package. Uh, so, and we get uh, in the output, the, uh, the coefficients of our regression in the console, you can see it's printed out. Good, then we can plot also data to see, see how it looks like, how our regression model uh, performed. So we plot data with a scatter plot, and then we can also plot the regression line uh, that we obtained. And on the right-hand side, you will see um, also the line appearing. Yeah, so this is this is how it looks like. Again, this is this was a very simple model with one, just a, one uh, variable uh, regression model, but we can uh, combine, of course, uh, multi multivariate regression models so we can build something like more uh, more complex. Uh, so, yeah, basically this would be um, general uh, generalized linear model with. Uh, multivariate and then we can see the output uh, coefficients for our regression. Okay, um, 
Yeah, so I mean, this is uh, the, the, uh, yeah, just the demonstration of, of how it how it looks like. So everything is done in our um, our studio. Basically, we connect to Opal and we perform data shield functions. So back to my presentation. Um, yeah, you saw that um, data shield functions are in fact, R functions that return the true output, uh, what the baseline R would uh, would output if these functions are allowed to be computed. So if there's enough data to compute on. There is no noise added, there is uh, no modifications on data whatsoever. And this means that the utility of data will be preserved. And this is one of the advantages of uh, such an approach compared to what we had before, um, with data modifying techniques such as anonymization and synthetic data or differential privacy. And these are the results from one utility analysis uh, where we compare the techniques on different uh, utility outputs. For example, we trained the linear model on data set and compared F1 scores. And you can see that the data shield preserves the one from native R. So you can see that the first, first row and last row are actually the same, the same value. And then the same, uh, same thing states for the other um, other functions, so mean and standard deviation for numerical uh, attributes and most frequent value and distribution uh, for the categorical attributes. And you can see in other techniques, we, can, we have some kind of degradation in, in the utility. So basically when utility preservation is the critical requirement, then Data shield or TREs in general have the advantage. Uh, the downside is that um, the analyst needs to be familiar with the framework. So, as I showed you, the data shield has its own set of functionalities. So, we need to account for time and effort to to get introduced to um, to the platform and to to perform the analysis in this way. Um, so, with data publishing, so with anonymity and synthetic data, the analyst is in fact much more flexible towards the techniques to use for their analysis, even though they will not preserve 100% of data utility as, uh, as data shield does. Uh, so, this, uh, with this, I am uh, getting back to Rudolf. We are anyway at the at the end. So the, this was basically the last uh, demo. So we I saw there was a question in the chat if data shield, uh, maybe generically the trusted research environments would be uh, a fair data point. Um, I guess it can be extended and adapted to it, but data shield itself, uh, I think, doesn't yet have this as a as either its goal, uh, Noah. Uh, the functionality at the moment, um, because Data Shield really provides basically the access and doesn't really provide any discovery methods at the moment. Doesn't really provide metadata about what data you have in the in the repository, which a fair data point should have. But that could be, in principle, uh, I guess, be added, and maybe that's something also the researchers might take up there. But I think at the moment the answer is no. Good, then I think we are we're finished with this. Um, Thomas, I'm not sure if we have any time for questions, so I guess we, we move on with the next well, I would say we are running slightly behind the schedule, so I would like to thank you for your presentation, and I think uh, we can answer the questions in the meantime in the chat, if there are any, and would like to invite Gerald for his presentation about the legal aspects of working with sensitive data. So then let's jump into the topic. Um, I'll start with the usual screen sharing uh, issues. So are you able to see the slides? Yes, we can see the slides. Ah, that's great. I love it when things go well. So. So hello, my name is Gerald. Um, I will try to introduce you to some of the aspects of uh, data sharing and access regarding the GDPR and legal, uh, legal side of things. Um, 
What I do at SBA Research is I am a legal counsel and a data protection supervisor. And I also do a little bit of consulting uh, regarding data protection. What I want to talk about today are a few uh, key elements of uh, data sharing and data analysis, and also some of the most important aspects of the uh, concepts of the GDPR, because that's, in my opinion, necessary to understand why there are limitations or exemptions, uh, especially for scientific research regarding uh, data sharing and access, uh, especially on the topic of uh, special categories of data, but that's something I'll go into. Then I'll fly over some points and then maybe go into a little bit uh, more detail with others. 20 minutes is um, ambitious, is, is ambitious, but uh, maybe I'll just uh, scratch on some of the, of the topics to, to uh, get to the more interesting points I have included in my slides. Um, just for an introduction, that's more or less what you know already that uh, data sharing and access to, to uh, data collections got harder by the, by the introduction of the GDPR but it's actually not impossible. Um, of course, there are some, some people who, who, who view the overall uh, point of, of the introduction of the GDPR more as, a, as, as hampering data sharing and access. Uh, I mean, it, this is a very, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, uh, it's a, a very pointed, um, maybe a little bit overdone because it's like, okay, legal barriers to international data sharing, impeding the future health research projects, undermining inter international collaboration. Uh, it, it's maybe how the, 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 the topic is seen from a very neoliberal perspective that's uh, coming from a think tank who works very actively uh, with, uh, with um, data analysis. So on the one hand, this might be correct, but on the other hand, the GDPR uh, has very much, a lot of positive aspects. And also, uh, as we will see, there are uh, lots of exceptions that are possible to apply if it's uh, concerning um, scientific research. So that uh, we have already, uh, we, we have also established uh, on the one hand, a commitment to research and to, to find compromise position to enable the sharing of health and scientific data um, what actually did not get better or easier is the transfer of data outside the European Union or the European Economic Area. That, that's an unresolved problem, I have to admit this. And also that the, the provision for the exceptions for scientific research, uh, they are mostly put down into a clause or in an article of the GDPR that opens it for national, um, uh, nation, national uh, legal, uh, uh, national legal uh, acts, and these are not 100% harmonized. So I can only talk about the perspective from an Austrian perspective. So the, the, the actual legal situation in other countries might vary. Uh, so a few concepts to start with. It's also a little bit interconnected with the points uh, Rudy and Tanya have talked about. It's, about, it's, it's, it's important to understand the, the, the topics of um, data pseudonymization, anonymization, or synthetic data from a little bit of a legal perspective so that you can better um, judge if it's which approach is better to take in a certain situation. Um, so I'll just jump over this. I mean, what's the processing? I don't have to go into this, but one of the most basic principles of the GDPR you might know is that any processing of personal data is basically forbidden, except there is an exception, which is put down in uh, Article 6 and later in Article 9. So for the legal basis, it's also important um, to, to understand that you cannot choose from several uh, of the legal basis. It's only one will be allowed to apply to your processing. So if you base your processing on consent, and uh, we will hear about consent a little bit later in detail, then you are not allowed if the consent does not hold up to say, ah, okay, but I have an exception of Article 9. So then if consent does not work, I'll just take one of the other legal bases. No, then you have the problem that uh, uh, your processing will not ha will have lost its legal basis and it will not be uh, possible to, uh, to repair this in the same or in an easy way. Um, the second set of, of concepts 
are uh, what's the controller and what's the processor. It, it's not uh, that important. It's more or less the people who uh, who hold the data. So the controller is the one who um, who, who 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 decides and can 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 choose the means and. Uh, uh, let the, the means of how to process the data is uh, is to be processed, and the processor is someone who can be told by the by the controller what to do with the data. So, in many situations, uh, a data repository can act as a controller or as a processor. Um, it, it can be a case of shared uh, responsibility. Uh, so, it's a joint processing uh, is a special situation where. You cannot really define one or the other is more responsible or is, uh, is is more or less telling can tell the other one how to process the data. So yeah, and the data subject is an an identifiable natural person. That's especially important to discern the difference uh, from from uh, synthetic data. And there are some uh, some 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 special topics with synthetic data um, and the per and personal data by themselves is every information relating to an identifiable natural person. Um, and that's a very crucial concept because actually the, the legal effects of uh, pseudonymization or anonymization or even encryption techniques, even they have a slightly different uh, focus, are actually determined by the, by, by the fact if the data that's treated by one of these methods uh, is personal data. And, can be related to a natural person. And then there's the special categories of data, which also include, for example, health data, um, where the, the, the hurdle of, of um, the data being allowed to, uh, to, to be processed is set a little bit higher. But also uh, there's the advantage of scientific research because especially for the article nine data, there's the exception I mentioned a little bit earlier that we can uh, rely on a different legal basis, and we don't have prob we probably don't have to to focus too much on the consent if we have already uh, established that we are working with Article Nine data, and there is a viable exception um, according to Article 18, uh, 89. So that's I, I just cited the the article uh, above, as you can see here. Um, the overall the overall target or and the purpose of Article 89 is what I mentioned in one of the uh, earlier slides to enable scientific research within the area of the European Union. And there are already uh, there are also set down safeguards and uh, derogations uh, for special uh, processing activities, archiving public interest, scientific or historical interest. Um, in Austria, that's the Forschungsorganisationsgesetz, uh, where this is uh, specified for the uh, for the Austrian legal system, and it's also important to understand that this especially addresses scientific research, and it's important here to take a little bit of a, of a, a differentiation because public research, which means it's for for governmental agencies or even for education or higher education. Uh, or even for nonprofit organizations is not necessarily defined as scientific research. Uh, it, it goes into too much detail to talk about the, the, the uh, specifics of this uh, differentiation, but keep in mind that uh, scientific research is handled as a very specific exception uh, and which might not apply to every field of uh, research as you might call it. Um, when you regard the data sharing and access, it's also possible, uh, it's made possible within the European Union, also within the, the uh, Article 89 frameworks for these special data categories. So on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, the, the harmonization is still not, uh, not, not fully, uh, fully has, not, has not fully been addressed. Um, and what's also important, and that's where we can, can do a mental, uh, can do, can do a mental cut because the GDPR will not apply to anonymized data and it will also not apply to synthetic data because synthetic data are not considered personal data. Why? Because as I told you before, uh, personal data always refers to an net identifiable natural person and behind synthetic data, there's never a, a natural person for the data set, just the creation. Um, you need for the creation of a synthetic data set, you need training sets. And these might refer to, to uh, real data, but I will come to that a little bit later. 
Um, to share data with parties outside the European Union, well, that's complicated. And there you cannot rely on the legal basis of the Article 9 exceptions, and you really have to re, uh, recall uh, consent or um, to, to uh, really use uh, a different method like pseudonymization or anonymization. Um, as Rudy also already said, encryption is not really referring to, uh, to the data themselves, the, the usage of the data or the intended use of the data. It just secures uh, access by parties who are not allowed to see the data, but it has nothing to do with the, with the extra, actual purpose of the processing. And also what's, uh, what's actually a problem currently is that uh, by, by, by creating data sets, which are by name called anonymized, which they are not, uh, or a derogation of article data. Um, that, that's, uh, that's also a, a quite detailed point. Um, it, it would actually hamper the, 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 the provision to, to the, uh, the provisions of the GDPR to be applied. So it would be better if there were frameworks or international legal frameworks who allow data sharing. So you don't try to circumvent uh, the lack of any regulations um, by using the data in a way it's not intended to, or by using uh, low key security techniques. So, but that's, as I said, that's an ongoing process and there's no actually uh, no, 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 no sound solution. I already talked about the, the legal basis, so I don't have to repeat that. Um, but even if you have established that your processing is uh, legal after GDPR, of course, you have to uh, adhere to the processing principles, but that's not, uh, not actually a secret. And um, I think it has been established that every analysis or sharing process of data within uh, the European Union or taught towards third, even towards third countries is subjected to the GDPR as long as it's uh, regarding personal data. And the privacy enhancing technologies like encryption, pseudonymization uh, that have already been mentioned are regarded as safeguards under the concepts of privacy by design or default and are necessary technical or organizational safety measures you will have to apply if you are working with any categories of data anyways. Um, also, it's important to understand that as long as the data you are using is considered personal data, so pseudonymous data or even encrypted data, will not circumvent that the GDPR is applicable. The GDPR is not applicable to synthetic data or really anonymized data, but uh, the process of anonymization or synthetization might still be uh, under the govern uh, might still be governed by the GDPR. Um, the legal differentiation from pseudonymization and anonymization is that the pseudonymization is defined as that in in in, in effect the data can no longer be attributed to a specific data subject without the use of additional information. Um, and the legal qualification about this uh, additional information, the me so the, the, the means that are reasonably likely to be used by a controller to identify a person has been established several years ago by the European Court of Justice in the, uh, the, the Breyer, uh, Breyer case. And as you can see, if you, if you read the commentaries about the judgment is that the concept of an identifiable natural person is very broad. So from a legal perspective, in that case, it was that uh, a dynamic IP address was still regarded as a, a personal as personal data because the person using the IP at a certain time could be re-identified if the controller and several other parties collude and, and join their efforts. And then you could actually uh, say which person has used an, a certain IP address at a certain time. Um, and that establishes also that the GDPR does not really distinguish the quality of a pseudonymization measure as we already uh, heard from, from Rudy and Tanya, how you can actually achieve pseudonymization or anonymization of a data set. Um, and it's, it's left open how 
such a process should be uh, should be conducted so that you really get a, a little security of your result that you say in the end it's uh, it's depending on your use case it might be prudent to still presume a residual risk of re-identification by a data recipient if you use pseudonymized data because on the other hand uh, there is a there is an open discussion uh, when a data set can be really regarded anonymized or pseudonymized uh, from, from a legal perspective. Um, but I'll get to that a little bit later. So um, that's actually the point of if that there's a very long paper on anonymization techniques by the Article 29 Working Party, um, which on the one side, it's, it's good because it establishes that if you have already obtained a data set from a, uh, from a different legal basis, the anonymization of that data set for further use uh, is usually compatible with the original purpose of the processing. So if you have collected data from some other for some other purpose, usually the anonymization and further use of the anonymous uh, data set is compatible with the original purpose. Um, and now that's the, the next point, that's, the, that's, the, that's a very uh, as a, uh, divisive point because it goes deeply into the into a legal discussion of how personal data is defined in a relative or in an absolute uh, approach, meaning that according to the means reasonably used to re-identify re uh, a data set by a specific recipient, you can either view it as a as a relative uh, in a relative approach. You say, okay, it depends on the means available to a specific re recipient if the data can be viewed as anonymized from his perspective. Uh, and the other approach is, okay, if any recipient in the world could probably with additional means re-identify the data, then the data cannot be regarded as anonymized uh, in, a, in a legal approach from, from a legal perspective. And actually, that's that doesn't make it any easier because a legally compliant anonymization can but not, not necessarily must be scientifically sound as we heard uh, from Rudy because different methods uh, lead to different um, different results from, uh, regarding the quality of anonymization and there is an ongoing controversy about the use of this absolute or relative approach in the GDPR and both approaches can be can be validly argued and are argued and since the GDPR itself mixes both terms, um, sometimes it would probably be better to err on the safe side and presume that data might be re-identifiable if it's uh, if, if if it's not um, if it's not one hundred percent sure how the how the quality of the of the anonymization or pseudonymization has been uh, conducted. Which brings me to the synthetic data, because as we already uh, uh, talked about, it's, it's not qualified as personal data under the GBR. Why? Because it does not belong to a natural person. You will need to have uh, an, an actual data set of personal data to create synthetic data. Um, and also here we can, uh, we can establish that compared or analogous to the, to, uh, in an analogy to the, to the anonymization, that you can uh, create a synthesized data set without changing the purpose limitation uh, principle or without uh, violating the purpose limitation principle. So if, if you create synthetic data out of an existing data set you have already obtained on a legal basis, on a valid legal basis, it is possible to do this, uh, which solves a lot of problems. Uh, as well uh, as uh, research I mentioned before is not strictly uh, identified or, or is not strict, strictly seen as uh, scientific research, but commercial research or even commercial purposes or third country transfer, transfers. All these problems are resolved by using synthetic data sets. Um, one special, uh, special uh, topic regarding synthetic data are the incidental matches and highly unique attributes, which uh, I think Rudy mentioned it uh, shortly. And uh, these are these are uh, phenomena that usually appear or usually occur in, in if a data set is uh, large enough, and they occur randomly. So 
a match is usually a consequence of a limited range of potential values or attributes you have for uh, for a certain um, for, for for a certain set. But the difference is that for a, for an observer, these matches would seem random. So you don't have you you cannot infer from a match from an incidental match to a real person, and also they are related to common patterns. So be it, uh, be it salary, for example, or certain health conditions. Um, if these are, uh, if, if you get the pattern which, is, which, which um, correlates with, uh, with a common pattern, which also is, is possible in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a real data set, and you have a match with a real person in a synthetic data set, which is random, then it will not be possible to infer actual information about a person or several persons from these synthetic data sets. Um, and it will also not allow anyone to infer information about the individuals from whom the data has been synthesized from. So that's more or less the, 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 two, the two most important uh, points with, with creating synthetic data. And from a legal perspective, it makes sense to address this by setting certain threshold values for synthetization to, uh, to avoid the inclusion or, or, or computation of especially rare values or outliers. So it all, but it, this all very, always depends on, on your setting and the risk you are taking with the, with the data sets you are uh, creating. So it was actually a sprint run and brings me to my key, po uh, key takeaways, but maybe we can answer a few questions also. Um, so What's important to understand is that GDPR on the one hand allows, but also restricts the uh, collection, analysis and sharing of personal data in scientific research. Um, it does not apply to anonymized data and synthetic data at all. So if you have data sets which are anonymized or, or are consisting of synthetic data, you don't have to care about uh, the GDPR, but if you create the data sets, the original data will, of course, be, uh, be, be subjected to the provisions of the GDPR. Uh, and also data sharing with parties outside the European Union or European economic area is hard from a legal perspective. Um, so there you will have to get a different legal basis. Most of the time it will be consent or you will have to refer to anonymization techniques to allow this kind of transfers. And applicable technical measures to um, improve data security and data privacy will also depend on the setting and your research targets. So the trusted research environment, so anonymization techniques, anonymization techniques, use of synthetic data. These are all viable, viable approaches, but you cannot, uh, you cannot really tell from a generalized uh, point of view that one is better than the other because it always depends on a case-by-case -case analysis which is the best approach for a certain research project. So thanks for the start. And we can take a look into the chat if there have been any complicated or yes, there is answerable one question. questions. Uh, I guess. Are there any best practice example of how issues of using and sharing data for research have been solved? Is it, is it more a legal or more a technical, uh, from a technical or from a re research, uh, a legal perspective? <laughs> from a legal perspective, there are a few publications which address the topic. Um, I have put them usually in the citations, and there are, I think, I, I, there are two uh, publications, uh, re mo more recent publications from from 2021 and 20, uh, 2020, which address the topics uh, of of. Um, I can put the links also in the chat, so that's one of them. And I'll put in the second one too, which is also very interesting. It addresses. Um, it addresses mostly encryption, but the, the principles that are discussed regarding the relative and absolute approaches uh, and the, the, 
the legal perspective and the legal use, uh, the, the, the legal discussion which underlies the the, the techniques used uh, are very good uh, are very well described in in, in the second in, in the second paper so you can take a look into this and it's quite interesting there is a follow up question from Michaela from my researcher's perspective how do i solve those issues It, it depends. I think in, you, you, first you have to look at the, uh, the provisions which Article 89 uh, defines as exceptions for your uh, jurisdiction, uh, because the, the, the basis of that the work regarding health data uh, or special categories of data uh, that, that to work with these for scientific research purposes is established in, in Article 9 and Article 89, but how it specifically resolved for your jurisdiction, uh, you have to look up the, the, the respective um, uh, legal, uh, legal basis. For Austria, I cited the, the Forschungsorganisationsgesetz. So you can uh, read out some of the provi uh, provisions for, for Austrian research. Uh, first of all, uh, you have defined what's qualified as a, as a research institute under Article 89 and so on and so on. And actually such legal uh, so, so, such legal acts should exist for also for, for every member state. And that's the problem I mentioned with it's not 100% harmonized. So there may, may be differences. But uh, overall, you can say, uh, look it up. And if you have uh, a, a method like a, a trusted research environment and your data is qualified under Article 9 and under uh, Article 89, um, it should be possible to access and work with the data. But it's also a case by, it has to be established by a case by case analysis. And I have an example from Austria, which we heard about in a, in a talk recently. I think it's not too long ago that in, in Austria, there, are, there is a, a large collection of public health data. But maybe Andreas can, can uh, get into this a little bit because I think my time is, is uh, used up. So I, 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 I yeah. just mentioned this um, because from a legal perspective, it, 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 it it belongs to the legal perspective, what I'll just tell you. Uh, if researchers want to access uh, the records of public health data, then, then they have to, uh, th there has to be established a very rigid and very formal uh, approach. Um, they have to write, uh, actually, this has to be, uh, it has to be approved by a commission. There has to be established a research target. Uh, and then the access to the research environment is granted for a limited time, but the analysis that have to be or want to be conducted have to be established upfront. So it's very, it's a, a quite a quite rigid process how you can, for example, approach the publicly collected uh, health data for certain research purposes. It's very uh, on point. You're, you're not flexible, like you can say, okay, I have this data set and I have already concluded with my uh, planned research, but I want to look up something I just came up with. It's it's not it will not be allowed, and it's also closely monitored and, and governed by uh, by contractual uh, by contractual basis. Thank you very much for your answers for your presentation. I think I have to stop here because we have two more presentations. Uh, so thanks a lot. And the next speaker is Fajar, who is going to talk about the consent. Floor is yours, Fajar. So hi, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. So, hi everyone. Um, I'm Fajere Kaputra, and um, today I would like to share a quick um, introduction to this consent handling for, or consent management for personal data processing. Um, as a background, so here we, well, a lot of now organization wanted to do this, something with their personal data, but one of them, well, one of the issue that is enforced by GDPR is that consent must be given for processing this personal data and therefore it's important for companies or organization to do this uh, compliance checking. And in general, there are two scenarios where actually you wanted to do your compliance checking. It's uh, either prior to data execution or we call it ex ante, where 
you uh, as a data controller provided your setup and these then will be checked against the consent of the users uh, assuming that all the users providing consents together with their data and then decision would be taken whether you wanted to um, continue with the with the processing and this considering that mo probably only 50 percent of all user actually uh, or your setup of uh, personal data handling or personal data processing only combined with half of the data um, of the user due to the constant issues. The second one is you can do this after data handling execution. We call it expose, where you do the um, you first execute your data processing and then you collect logs of your data processing, and then later on this log is mapped to data handling representation. Afterwards, you do this compliance checking. So then, uh, if you found any violation um, of your processing against the user consent, then you will do some follow-ups, like uh, probably reporting or even like um, not reusing the, the, the result and so on. But this is outside of the discussion for, for today. This actually leads to some technical challenges. Um, two of them, uh, what we would like to discuss a bit today is how to represent this consent. Of, of the user and then the data handling of the data controller in a machine machine actionable form. And also how to do this uh, compliance, how to check the compliance of the data handling against the user, uh, the given user consent. For the representation currently, there is uh, an active working group, this W3C data privacy vocabulary, where now they already released like uh, version 0.4 of their um, community group report. The aim is to provide like machine readable metadata for the use and processing of personal data based on legislative requirements such as GDPR, but not only that, because in other parts of the world, there are also like um, different regulation that, um, that, um, that that's also um, similar to GDPR as well. Inside of this uh, DPV, they have um, a set of concepts, relation as, as well as the concept taxonomies introduced. Um, in here means that uh, for, for the taxonomies we, which, will, which you will see later, if user give consent for a, a higher concept, which implies that they also provide consent for all its sub-concepts. It provides uh, a way, well, the way they describe it now, it allows you to do some flexible adoption. For example, now they have different serialization as OWL2 or SCOS. So depending on the use case, you might want use or the other. This is an example of the taxonomy provided by the DBV. So for example, in the processing, the, if you give consent to any kind of processing, you can say that, okay, I allow any kind of processing. It means that any kind of data processing below that, it's also allowed by your consent. The same with the purpose. For example, if you say that I want to give consent to uh, any kind of research and development, it means that you allow consent for doing uh, for for the for your data to be used for academic research, commercial research, or non-commercial research, and so on. Okay, that's for the representation. I will provide like a real example later, but let's go forward because we need to move a bit about the compliance checking mechanism. So there are several ways to do so when you already represent your consent and data handling in the machine actionable form, there is a several different option to do the compliance checking between the consent of the user and the data handling. Two of them I provided here. The first one is OWL2, reasoning, um, those approach using OWL2 reasoning. Um, this is based on a some assumption checking. Um, originally part of the special project and then adaptation of the approach has been uh, tried out in several um, other projects as well. And um, they're doing this based on, yeah, already said before about uh, based on the all two reasoning. The second approach is more uh, not really using the reasoning capability, but they are using the constraint based approach where you're, they are using the what's so called SQL engine. This is also part of the semantic web technology stack as the validation mechanism. This was uh, more recent, it's just proposed last year. And this could be another option to do this compliance checking mechanism. Let's now just to, to, to try to, to bring this in, into the ground again to, to, to make it more concrete. Let's 
let's provide an example here. So let's say that you have now like a four different user group with different content provided to your system uh, for, for their personal data. There is the open one, which provide content without any exception. So you can use it for anything. The limited time, so those consent only saying that you can use my data, but on, only until certain time, like today, for example. The academic research means that, well, there is no time limit. You can use it anytime, but only for academic research. And there is a fourth uh, user group which say that, well, consent is only for the strict uh, purpose. Like uh, I have the time limit until today and only for any kind of research, but not for non-research purpose. That's the different user group that give their consent. And then there are two uh, planned data processing by the data controller. The first one is uh, somebody who actually wanted to do some general research planned for today. And the other one is those that wanted to do academic research that's planned for tomorrow. Let's take this uh, two example, the academic research versus general research. Uh, so the consent for the academic research versus the handling of the general research. Here, this would be an example representation of the OWL2. Um, it's a bit uh, complicated, but I mean, important is that you see that um, there is this uh, um, object of uh, personal data handling. They have a number of properties coming from the DVV and some um, restriction on the, on, the, on the expiry time. So uh, they only do it until certain time, uh, in this case today. And the second one, this is the consent. That's saying basically you can use my data until any time and uh, for academic research only. Here in the fourth part of the of the of the um, consent and handling, they are more or less compliant. So any kind of data is the same. Processing also, the recipient also it means that actually any kind of recipient can get your data, and the time limit. It's um, since the consent say that you can use it for uh, for for uh, any time you want. The handling uh, is compliant to that, but then there is the fourth one, which is the purpose saying that the data handling say, I want to do, the, uh, do, do something with, for the purpose of research and development that might include some commercial research. But my con uh, the, the user consent say that, no, I only wanted my data to be used for academic research. And therefore there is some mismatch here. And this means that uh, this is not compliant. And this kind of checking is what is being done by the, um, by the engine that I, I mentioned earlier. So looking into the four, uh, like, uh, four different consent and the two um, handling that we have, um, we can then do this um, logical um, checking just by, by looking into it. The open one, well, it will be fits to all of the two um, analysis. This one is more, um, this is not compliant because the academic research and research and development is not, um, is, is not match. This one is okay. Um, this is exactly the same, so that's that's totally fine. Um, this one is also compliant. Um, this is not because of the time limit, because the the, the start consent only limited the use only for today, while the plan is for tomorrow. And the last one is also not uh, compliant, both because of the time and uh, the type of the purpose. So, as a summary. This would be like uh, uh, what, I, what I did show is the how to represent user consent and data, uh, data handling, as well as the compliance um, check, checking tools. Uh, Note that this is just uh, some of the available one and it might be others as well. Thank you. Now I give this back to Tomek, please. Thank you very much, Fajr, for a quick crash course on consent management. Since we're running out of time, I will skip the questions. Please ask them in the chat. And the next speaker will be Laura Waltersdorfer, who will be talking about uh, um, auditability. So Laura, the floor is yours. We cannot hear you. Now we can what? hear. Is it better? <laughs> OK, thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, I will also start sharing the screen. One moment. Do you see my screen? Yes, we can. 
Okay. Then I will just start. Hello, uh, my name is Laura Waltersdorfer and I will give a quick um, introduction to auditability and why it will is important and why it will be more important um, in because of future regulation probably. <clears throat> so without further ado, um, let's start with the definition. So um, just as a context and back background, um, since increasingly artificial intelligence and here mostly machine learning is applied to sensitive data in different use cases, um, this is oftentimes leading to intransparent, um, not re really understandable models um, leading to, to different or not an understandable results, uh, which was the reason why the guidelines for trustworthy AI uh, was published by the European Commission in 2019, listing seven key requirements for um, developing such trustworthy AI or leading to, to more trustworthiness in, in AI development. And two key requirements are transparency and accountability for which auditability can be seen as a means to achieve um, higher transparency and accountability of such systems. So as they also define auditability as the enablement of the assessment of algorithms, data and design processes, um, here the focus is really on, uh, so the connection is to standards and regulations and um, also industry standards, for example, but it's also concerned with traces of the system itself and also documents um, describing the design process and also design decisions, for example. Um, and one of the reasons why this is increasingly important is that audits are mentioned increasingly in, in AI regulations uh, all over the world internationally in, in the drafts um, that are available right now. And this brings me to, to the next point, um, what can be achieved by an audit? Of course, um, audits have to be targeted at some, some uh, bigger goal. Um, such as the ethical considerations, which I will not focus on too much, but like the lower scale fairness and um, bias and discrimination to, to avoid this quality of service, also not too much of the focus um, on this one. But what might be interesting to you also is um, that regulation that is currently in draft process, such as um, for the European Union, the AI regulation draft um, is mentioning auditability and also audits as a means to, to control um, to check, um, for example, potential risks and also to assess the, the overall transparency of the system. So um, notable uh, articles would be here, the article 12, which is record keeping or also article 13, which is um, transparency and provision of information to users. This is not an exhaustive list, but um, the, the most applicable ones for now for auditability. And also the Digital Service Act, which is more focusing on um, online services uh, and especially for the very large online platforms. Um, they also mention audits um, for risk, risk assessment and that they should be regularly um, be subject of such an independent audit to, to check um, their functioning, for example. Uh, but the EU is only one of these examples who, who, have, who have been drafting um, such regulation. Also, the US has been talking about something like this in, in the proposal for the Algorithm Accountability Act. But um, for now, the EU seems to be um, the most, like the most um, established one as in the draft form it is now. Um, but Stepping uh, back from the from the regulation for now, um, I just want to highlight some related approaches since this whole audit uh, and auditability sphere is still ongoing work. Um, there, there are some related approaches that can, of course, be reused, such as um, provenance and metadata management. And here you might be already aware um, or not about um, the prof ontology, for example, which is a well-established data model now for, for provenance data uh, consisting of basic um, objects such as agent, entity, and activity with the possibility to um, have different relationships between these objects um, to, to really structure data and traces according to this um, data model. The P plan is also a an, an really relevant uh, extension of this prof ontology 
for workflow definitions. Initially, it was um, more for scientific workflows, but uh, it's in a generic format that can be also used to, to map up um, templates for other workflows uh, to validate traces, for example, which could be useful for, for auditing traces. Another approach is for example, the, the model cards, which is basically a documentation template for machine learning models to, to describe more the decision process um, on, on different designs, on the training process to give more overview of, of the machine learning uh, model at hand, which could also be used for, for audits. To further exemplify this, uh, I want to, to show you just this really basic process of an audit. Um, it's really simplified for now, but basically there are the four steps um, that at first there is, of course, the definition of an audit aim and scope. So here, of course, um, suitable standards or policies should be um, used as a guideline. Then uh, in the second step, the audit data sources and also the questions and requirements need to, to be defined. Uh, so for example, the audit questions could be mapped to, to users to, to somehow formulate these. And also the mapping of traces of the systems need or could be optionally done to make the machine readable and to automate this, that process to a certain extent. Uh, in a third step, um, the whole setup of the audit and potential tools uh, could be done. So for example, just the audit box that was also developed in our context of the project Wellford um, to support this, this audit process and the collection of, of traces. And in the fourth step, um, the traces would be analyzed then to generate the audit report and also result to then um, formulate an action plan, for example, uh, what can be improved or um, also what, what was uh, the current state at a certain time point. Uh, to just uh, really exemplify this quickly, um, so we can choose here the, the GDPR and companies policies to, uh, to be checked if that was um, done in a correct way by the traces, then the audit question would be um, exemplified to a user for what was the personal data used to, to have checks and uh, check the traces, um, what consent was given at a, give, uh, at a time uh, frame, as the has already uh, shown. And then um, just as a short overview, what could be done by the audit box or also by other tools to take the, the generic traces coming from different system components and map them into some machine readable way uh, according to the workflow definition that was previously given to check that uh, the, the correct processes were conducted. In the end, you basically then can generate an audit report and have an overview of, of a certain uh, system state. With that, I want to thank you very much for your attention and give back to, to Tomek. Thank you very much, Laura. It was a quick uh, introduction to auditability. And now, last but not least, we have Andrea Sakalhat from SBA Research, who is going to say a few words about the Wellport project and how all these things fit together. Andrea, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. You can hear me? Yes, we can hear, we can see the slides. Perfect, that's what I wanted to know. Um, so I'm just going to give you a brief overview on the Wellford project and the resulting platform and many of the concepts we have heard about in the talks today, they have been included in this project. So Wellford is funded by FFG under the Bridge program. It's a national project and focuses on industrial research. The project ran for three years and we have four partners. The lead scientific partner is SBA Research. It's a competence center for IT security with more than 100 employees. The main focus is security research, but they also offer professional services. This includes, for example, security testing, testing in particular penetration testing, security consulting, but also security trainings. The second scientific partner is the Technical University of Vienna, and we have two company partners. One of them is Medicos AI, and they focus on helping people to understand medical reports and health data. And the second company is Heart Balance. They primarily work with very heart rate variability data and use this for fitness advice and well being. So, the main focus of the project was that companies typically want to analyze the data they collect and thereby come up with new innovative services, providing insights. However, as we have heard in the legal talk before, 
there are regulations in place and handling personal, in particular sensitive data, comes with a lot of responsibilities. So the goal of the project was to come up with concepts for privacy preservation as well as auditability. And the main scenario we were looking there is we have a company, company offers an application, for example, a mobile application, and then we have a user base. They collect or generate data within those applications. And what we wanted to reach is that users always stay in control of their own data. And the first thing we would need for that is a secure repository. So the applications can send the data directly to the repository. And in addition, we wanted a way that users can provide fine-grained consent for this data and thereby stating what is allowed to happen to the data. This applies to what Fajr told us before. And now if a company wants to analyze this data, they will never get direct access to this raw repository. But instead, they have to come up with an experiment plan. There they state what's the purpose, what's the processing going to be. And then the platform can automatically try do a matchmaking and check what, where consent is available for this specific purpose, and then create a trusted analysis environment. For this environment module, we use DataShield. We have heard the concept in the very first talk today. And thereby, we have some guarantees that individual data cannot be extracted, but still the analyst has possibilities um, to work on the data. And the same concept also should work if you want to do some cross data analysis or cross application analysis, for example, for research purposes. So a researcher could file this research plan, again, stating the research purpose. And regardless of the application or company inside the platform, we could check if consent is avail available for this research purpose, and then again, create an analysis environment specifically for this one researcher. Finally, on top, we have this audit box. Laura just told us, told us about some of those concepts there. And basically, any activity inside the platform is stored in a provenance database. And an auditor then has the possibility, for example, to show everything that happened to a specific user's data within the platform over its lifetime. We implemented a proof of concept for this platform. Parts of the code are available on GitLab. We also have screencasts there showing, for example, how a researcher can start an experiment, selecting purpose, data categories, and then gets this R client or DataShield client to conduct the actual research. Here are just listed two articles. They provide a nice overview pretty much on everything that happened within the project. And in particular, this um, journal publication summarizes how we solve challenges and also how we implemented those. Finally, our research team again, there's the link to the project. And if anyone from the audience wants to know more details or has some ideas for extensions or joint research, then we would be happy if you contact us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, I would like to thank also to all the speakers today. Very good job. I think there was a lot of information provided. Uh, and uh, I would like to apologize to everyone for running slightly late. Uh, just last information, we will share the slide afterwards. We will share the recording of this session. And now the official part of the meeting ends. I will stop the recording. If you have some questions, we may now uh, answer them. So please just unmute and, and, and speak.